when I use the word Protestant, I don't want to have to keep reminding myself that in the 16th century, Martin Luther disagreed with the Pope. That's not my quarrel. And if Protestant is a label for history's sake, I'd prefer not to use it. Which leaves the alternatives of wishing the word dead and buried or using it in a new and livelier way. But it is a label. And I've come to America with the idea that to the true Protestant, all labels, all institutions, all structures are suspect. And why America? Because it's one of the most Protestant nations in the world. Not just in its 72 million practicing Protestants, but in the very making of the nation whose founders had Protestantism in the marrow. The search began at a place 200 miles from New York. Martin Marty, professor of church history in the University of Chicago, took me to a simple old meeting house at West Barnstable in New England. Why did you bring me to this building to start searching for Protestantism? I think this building displays in the vividness of its central symbol, the pulpit and the Bible, much of the beginning of Protestantism and much of what Protestantism still thinks it's about. It is a gathering of Christian people in a locale in great simplicity to hear the word of God and to meet each other. But uh, we're not now talking about what is going on now, or are we? In a sense, what is going on now is so large, so impersonal, so aggressive, that it's hard to remember the simplicity of these beginnings, the clarity with which we see a pulpit for spoken word, the Bible, these have remained, and some of the sense of a congregation gathered, this remains, but the production has changed its character greatly, yes. But how does this hold up when you look at a piece of modern urban America? Dr. Marty suggested a search limited to one city, and the city we picked on was Indianapolis in the Midwest. My first impression was of war memorials and streets set at right angles and everything very flat. When you call it the average American city, nobody seems to object. It's the capital of the state of Indiana, politically conservative, has one million inhabitants, 15% of them black, and, I was surprised to find out, over 1,100 churches. Every weekend, both the local papers have three pages of church advertisements, and it's a weekend's work to sort them out. Baptist, Southern Baptist, Episcopal, Church of Christ, Church of the Nazarene, Pentecostal, Apostolic, Church of God, Methodist, Lutheran, Assemblies of God, Free Methodist, Independent Baptist, Full Gospel. Christ is the answer! Christ is the answer! Yes, he is the answer to the world's ills today. He is the answer to your ills. He is the answer to your problems. Uh, if you'll come unto Jesus, Jesus is the answer to every need uh, of this hour. King Jesus, let every tongue confess that he is Lord. If there's one here tonight and we don't know who wants to come and be a part of the church of God, we seek for them to come right now and say, yes, I think I hear you. In spite of everything tonight, Every I valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight.
preacher you missed on Sunday will pursue you on radio or television or lure you into a bookshop. In Martin, uh, uh, will you bow down with me in prayer? And if you ask God to come in and to save you this morning. The Bible Church came together to worship on the Lord's Day. I dare say after a time you learn to discriminate and filter in only what you want to hear and see. But on first impact, coming at you from every angle, it's overwhelming. How on earth do you hold on to the simplicities of a New England meeting house when you've got such a multiplicity of Protestantism and Protestant churches to choose from? To the people up close who are members of them, there are hundreds of differences that matter. But from the distance of the traveler, the searcher, the question of their public impact, I believe it falls finally in two fairly neat groups. On the one hand, there are the churches that through the centuries have been very much at home in their culture, so much so that we have come to call them mainline or mainstream, Methodist, Baptist, Lutheran, Congregational, Episcopal, Presbyterian, or whatever, who would uh, still clearly make up the majority of Protestants in America and of course around the world. On the other hand, you have people who are interested particularly in using this word of God and this scriptural word to rescue people out of a bad world, to save individual souls, to give them a great sense of authority and security on their life's pilgrimage. They're usually called fundamentalist. The biggest fundamentalist church in Indianapolis is called the Baptist Temple, which is independent of the Baptist denomination. Whatever it is the fundamentalist churches are providing must be meeting some enormous need. There's no other way to account for their startling growth rate in the last few years. 58 buses ferry worshippers from all parts of the city and beyond. Well over 3,000 come to Sunday school and there are special services for the deaf and the retarded. sing tonight, I want to be there when they crown him king of kings. But before they do that, let's everyone stand tonight and sing Smile a While, will you? And give your face a rest. All right. Here we go. Smile Behind the rise of any of these churches, there's the person of the preacher. In 20 years, Dr. Greg Dixon has built his membership from 300 to 7,000. And it's they who provide his yearly budget of well over $2 million. I asked Dr. Dixon to explain what his church believes. Well, we have uh, uh, basically what we call 22 articles of belief of which uh, primarily center around the person of Jesus Christ, who is Jesus Christ. We believe that he is the very God, that he was manifest in the flesh. We believe that he was truly virgin born, that he lived for 33 and a half years without sin, that he died uh, a vicarious atoning death on the cross, that after three days and three nights, he literally, visibly, bodily, rose from the grave, appeared to many, uh, 500 at one time. And 40 days after that, from the Mount of Olives, ascended into the heavens, and he is literally, visibly, physically coming again to this earth to reign. And I would say in a nutshell that that is what we believe. Would you describe yourself as a, as a Christian fundamentalist? 
Yes, definitely. Could you explain to somebody who may not know what the word means, what it means? Well, the word fundamental, as you know, really means basic. We just get down to the basics. And uh, our first cardinal belief is that the Bible is the Word of God, verbally inspired, to be believed literally. Tonight, for these few minutes together, I want to bring a message entitled, Heaven and How to Go There. I believe tonight, if you could get into a rocket ship and propel yourself beyond the atmosphere, the stratosphere, the ionosphere, on past this solar system of ours, on past the Milky Way that makes up our galaxy, and on past a million other galaxies like this, you would come to a place that the Bible calls heaven. When I say that heaven is a real place, I mean that it can be geographically located. I mean that heaven is as real as Chicago or New York City or London or even Indianapolis. Fundamentalism has good moments and bad, but it has existed now for a century in some form or other. It is always militant, it always does battle for the Lord, and its biggest battle began with Darwin over a hundred years ago. The idea that we may have evolved or descended from monkeys or apes, that is uh, to them an assault on biblical truth. I'm no kin to the monkey, no, no, no. The monkey's no kin to me, yeah. I don't know much about his ancestors, but mine didn't swing from a tree. It seems so unbelievable, and yet they're saying it's true. They're teaching us about it in school now, that humans were monkeys once too. Whoa, I'm no kin to the monkey, no, no, no. The monkey's no kin to me, yeah. I don't know much about his ancestors, but mine didn't swing from a tree. All right, boys and girls, let's sing this morning the creation song. I want to see everybody singing, and nobody's just sitting. Let's see all the mouths working. Ready? And God said the sun should shine, the rain should fall, and the birds should sing, and God said the flowers should grow, and it was so, was so. This Sunday school class at the Baptist Temple is one of 205 classes under the same roof. 205. Boys and girls, let's fold our hands. Dear Heavenly Father, we come We started our school because we felt we had to combat secular humanism and uh, philosophical relativism in the public school system in America. What are the symptoms of that sort of relativism? How does it come out in American life? Well, it comes out in the permissive society. Uh, again, uh, you're teaching children that they're not really responsible, that their environment is, has caused them to be the way they are, and um, that they do not have a personal responsibility to God. If a man doesn't have a personal responsibility to God, uh, he has no personal responsibility to his parents, oh. to his sister, to his brother. The words of Jesus, love thy neighbor, is totally undermined in that kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. This is why we have this unbelievable crime rate uh, in America. The, the mastermind, of course, behind it all is uh, is the spirit that the Bible calls Satan or the devil. Are you aware of uh, a communist threat and a diabolic threat being identical? Yes, I certainly believe that communism is in our generation the greatest tool of Satan that we have to enslave not only the minds but the spirits and the bodies of men. And I believe today that we have communist clergymen in pulpits in prominent churches in America who are preaching uh, not the gospel of Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection, good news of Christ, but rather they're preaching a social gospel, which in reality is, is just pure socialism. We hear 
hear a lot of talk about the ecumenical movement. They say that we should get together and all be one big family. Catholic, Protestant, and Jew, Buddhist, Muslim, and Hindu. I guess they want the devil to win the ecumenical movement. They always talk about the golden rule and the sermon on the mount. But whether you have ever been born again doesn't even seem to count. I know my sins are all forgiven and I am on my way to heaven. My trust is in the Lord and not the ecumenical movement. It struck me, sitting in this hall, that if I were to get up and suggest that Protestantism is about challenge and change and the shedding of labels, they'd tell me I'd got it wrong. Sonny Snell is one of six full-time ministers at the Baptist Temple. The purpose behind all this vast organization, the buses and so on, what's the one thing you're out to do? Evangelism. Say, get people saved. Get them ready for heaven. Can you describe to me what being saved is? Yes, sir. Being saved is S-A-V-E, okay? If a man is drowning, you throw him a rope to pull him out of the water. Our world is drowning and going to hell. We need to throw him a rope. And Jesus said, I am the lifeline. So we're throwing the rope, the lifeline to Jesus Christ and pulling them out of danger, lifting them out of the miry clay and setting their feet upon a solid rock. What if a fellow says, I'm quite satisfied with life as it is. I don't think it's so bad. I don't think I'm too evil. I don't want all this paraphernalia of being saved, what would you say to him? Okay, now, can I ask you a question? Please. Your name is Ron. Yes. Are you saved, Ron? I don't think so. Okay, if you were to die today, where would you go? I have no idea. Okay, now, according to the Bible, according to the Word of God, it says that if we die without Jesus Christ in our heart, we'll go to hell. Now, do you want to go to hell? I don't know where hell is. Okay, hell is without God. I don't know where it is either. Mm -hmm. But hell is without God. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now look, not my word, not my church. Mm -hmm. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now there's a distinction there, isn't there? One is the wages of sin, mm -hmm. that's death. That's hell, okay? But the gift of God is what? Eternal life. And it's not through the Baptist church, the Methodist church, the Catholic church, not through a church or denomination, it's through a person, Jesus Christ. Now, if, if I was to ask, now, Ron, logically, which one of these two things would you want if they were real? I'd want the one I could be true to. I don't okay. want to be frightened into it. Okay, now, now I, I don't want to frighten, I, I think you're too intelligent to be frightened into anything, unless a man's holding a gun on you, okay? I mean, I, I think you're a little bit more intelligent than that. Okay, now, you may get a little kid and say, I'm going to beat the snot out of you, and he may get, he may get scared. You see what right. I mean? Okay, but now, according to this, there's two things here. One is the wages of sin, and one is the gift of God. As a logical thinking person, which one of these two, if you made a decision, which one of these two would you want? I'd like eternal life. Okay, now, how, what is eternal life, according to the Bible? The gift of God. The gift of God. Now, if, I, if you were sincere about asking Jesus to come into your heart so you could have eternal life, I'd just bow right here with you and lead you in a short prayer, something like, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and save me. I don't want to go to hell when I die and then believe it in your heart, and then you would have the same salvation that I've had. This earth is the dressing room for eternity. This is the preparation room. Have you made preparation? Do you have reservations in heaven? Is your name written on the reservation list? The Lamb's book of life. If not, on the assurance of the holy word of God, I tell you tonight, you can know, you can make reservations for heaven. But they must be made on this side of death. For today is the day of salvation. If you accept the invitation, you'll come forward for baptism. What you've decided in private 
has to be acknowledged in public. Behind the pool is an artist's impression of the River Jordan. What's your name? Loretta Aarons. Loretta Aarons. Okay. Loretta Aarons, upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. However retiring any member of the congregation may be, this is the one moment he has to stand up and be seen alone. Richard Burge, upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Richard, I could see what was happening, uh, people going into water and coming out again, but can you describe what it is that's made you want to do this? Well, as you look around the world today and see the events taking place, all the wars and, and all the strife that's going on, I, uh, and see the different people that's taking part in all this. Why I, and myself, I've never went to church. And I, I started going about a year ago. And listened to all, <coughs> all these different men, men of the gospel, that really uh, preach the gospel of Christ. And, and hearing these men, and to me, it, it touched me. And I felt like that I should get myself right. I was brought up to believe that doubt is the companion of faith. That he who hesitates isn't lost, he may be about to make sense of something. In fundamentalist churches, there is no doubt and no hesitation, at least on the surface. When the preacher asks the question, which of you is saved, and all the hands shoot up, it's as if the last judgment had already happened and the sheep know that they're sheep, and all the rest are goats. For me, attending services here is rather like being at the political rally of a party you don't belong to, and it's easy to be repelled. But things change when you start talking to individual people. Then you start wondering what extremes of lostness and hesitation the buoyant style may be covering. Perhaps people can only stand so much insecurity and so much hesitation. And how they distribute the load is their problem. What Dr. Marty called the mainline Protestant churches are indeed hard to miss. Some of them have the grandeur of European cathedrals, and most of them look as though they have earned and paid for the right to be where they are.
The search for one place in Indianapolis to stand for the main line narrowed down eventually to North Methodist Church. Very different from the little nonconformist chapels I remember. Most of these churches admit that their membership is declining, but they're still well filled and, to an outsider, don't seem anxious. Dr. Richard Hamilton is the minister of North Methodist Church. The Methodism I grew up with was the Methodism of dissent. I feel your Methodism is different from that. Do you dissent or do you consent to the society you live in? <laughs> well, I'm afraid most people and I would say Methodism consents. It's a part of our society. And uh, the whole tone of dissent that was in the beginning is, uh, is distant to most of us here. What's the most important thing you do? most important thing I do? Well, the most important thing I do, I think, is to try to relate my understanding of the life and work of Jesus Christ to individual persons. It isn't a matter of trying to uh, rescue either myself or other people from uh, uh, a burning fire. It's, it's a matter of trying to release me and other people to be what we're really intended to be. There is more to North Methodist Church than Sunday worship. The worship place, what they call the sanctuary, occupies just one side of a spacious quadrangle. And then the new parts, these, what are they? Well, they're basically educational space and are widely used by all kinds of community groups and uh, uh, educational ventures, community service all projects, week, all just week long, long and schools use the place, mm -hmm. many groups. And this is your notice board? Yes, that helps people catch up with all of the things that are happening on any particular day of the week. You wonder, looking at the notice boards, whether there's any danger of the Protestant simplicities of the Bible and the preacher being lost under the weight of sheer busyness. How to read the Bible. Run by you? What the questions are. No, another clergyman who's a member of the congregation, not a member of the staff. And to help these kids, so... The Committee for Community Concern meets once a month. Ralph Franklin Jr. is on parole and he's approaching various local churches for help with the scheme he's working on called Youth Illustrates. And we have gotten together and decided that um, the type of crimes that we have committed ourselves and the type of crimes that we are seeing committed on the streets isn't actually what should be happening. So we are now together, we formed our own little organization to help stop this crime. Now the way we do it is we give crime dramas on stage. In other words, Nobody in this room would dream of asking either this boy or me if we're saved. It suddenly struck me. I'm in the middle of a fundamentalist nightmare with a social gospel supplanting the fundamentalist verities of heaven, hell, and personal salvation. Dick Fredland chairs the committee and is a university lecturer in politics. Is he wise to let his religion push him into social action? That's certainly subject to interpretation, but as far as, as I personally am concerned, there's no other way to do it. This is, this is what Christianity is. This is what religion is. It's not an inward directing force, but it's an outward directing force. Uh, we've got to improve the condition of humankind. Why? This is the price I think one pays for being part of the human race. Is there then no distinction between the work that you do in this context and what somebody, some atheistic, well-wishing person does? The effect may be the same. The motivating, uh, the impetus would certainly be different. 
the, the, the atheist would be a humanist. Uh, we're doing it in the name of religion. I think there's always a search, too, for meaningfulness in our own lives. And we all have some very basic needs, emotional, whatever. And a lot of that has to do with how we experience religion. And to every person, it's very different. And it depends on our upbringing, our needs, what type of person we are. There's also a self-fulfilling kind of, of element in, in this fulfilling of others. Uh, as you cast your breads on the water, so that so you will receive. And I think there's an element of hope that, that one, a selfish hope that's involved in this, but also an obligation of participation in society. But where society begins and North Methodist Church ends is a line too blurred for me at least to trace, which may account for the feeling you get that with all their wealth and conscience and hard work, the main line are curiously unemphatic. Perhaps they've lost their Protestant protest. They conceived a society and made it happen and promptly merged into their own landscape. After the Second World War, there was a real boom in mainline religion, and even 10 years ago. But they took great risks in society. They were very Protestant in that they were also very self-critical. And today they're suffering for this. They aren't growing as rapidly, and some of them are actually declining. And if you're a historian watching the change of mood in history, you probably sense this. Do, do you see any tendency of the mainline churches to pull back and to uh, commit themselves less to the world outside the church? That would be one way to put it, uh, pulling back. It is true that they are not taking some silly risks, and they may have taken silly risks some time ago. I'd rather put it much more positively, that Protestantism renews itself by getting to its sources and resources. Uh, this means that in the mainline churches, there is more attention again to inner spiritual life, to the life of meditation and prayer, to the recovery of the impetus that people get from the Bible. But I don't think this means for the mainline that they can go back and regress and burrow down into a hole and shelter themselves from the world. I think I'd rather picture it that they're on a strategic retreat for the sake of the next advance. <laughs> Methodists made me think again of the place of doubt in a person's faith. Dr. Marty called it the fuel on which faith feeds. But it takes a strong man to hold on to his doubts while fundamentalists up the road gain ground by preaching certainty. The reading of the scripture from the second chapter of the Gospel according to John. <laughs> Two days later there was a wedding in the town of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. What they're being offered is neither more nor less than the Protestant essentials we started with, the community of a people and the guidance of a book. I don't think stories about my relatives will feature much in the long search, but I think my aunt's Bible should. Not that there's anything special about it, but you can't talk about Protestantism without talking of the relationship between a person and a book. And this is the case I know best. It was given to her in 1906 for repeating by heart seven psalms. For 50 years, until she went blind, she made notes in the margins. Names of preachers, dates of sermons, events, public and private, little messages to herself. Before Psalm 126, she wrote, If you are discouraged, read. Against some severe verses in the book of Jeremiah, she wrote, God save Barnsley. That's the town she lived in. Alongside the words in St. John's Gospel, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, she wrote, Worship anywhere. This book, then, was her portable church, 
but it was the constant cross-reference between the book she read and the world she lived in which kept her growing. If her story were unique, I wouldn't be telling it. The point is that in the Protestant tradition, it's fairly common. Now, in, in the churches of, of which we're speaking now, the one of which I'm a part, grown up in, um, there's much more room for, uh, for the ambivalent and for the open-ended question and for exploration and uncertainty on a personal level. Uh, we welcome that. We see that as a growing edge, but it is not as satisfying to many, many people. It's more demanding, um, and uh, many people in our congregation, I think in most churches, say in many different ways over and over again, but can't we reduce it all to something that I can wrap up and put on the mantle or put here or here? and know that I've got it. Um, that desire is, is authentic, and it's a part of me, too, but alongside it is this other uh, question. I, you know, your mind is, is limited. Your understanding is limited. Your heritage is narrow. Uh, there's truth a lot bigger than you know and understand. And you have to leave that edge open. I've been trying to work out why it is that with all the fine and impressive things that are happening elsewhere in Indianapolis, we keep being drawn on this search to a small, not very well appointed, Baptist chapel in one of the poorer quarters of the city. I asked Professor Marty if he'd any idea why, and he, unexpectedly, I thought, made the point that the gospel of Jesus deals with the rights of the dispossessed, the underprivileged, the disinherited. The answer, he thought, might lie somewhere there. Mount Vernon Baptist Church is rickety, overcrowded, and hot. It can reach out to parts of the community that might lie hidden from most other churches. On Thanksgiving Day, when all America is reckoned to sit down to turkey and cranberry and pumpkin pie, Mount Vernon cooked and sent out turkey dinners for anyone, black or white, who wouldn't otherwise have one. And they've done it for the last four years. Two. All right, sweetheart. Thank you for... All right, and thank you for calling. Bye now. Seven. Yeah. Huh? Seven more. Yeah, seven more. Seven more. Then we're going to start off about 29 after that. <laughs> How many people could you could you give a meal to this, this year? This year? About 2,000. Really? Yeah, about 2,000. We have about 2,000 because we have 60 turkeys prepared. Now, and we have some more. Well, 60, all up under here, 60 turkeys. But were they brought in from, with an, from another oven? The well, the Methodist Hospital cooked 30 turkeys for us. The uh, Winona Hospital fixed 20 turkeys for us. The minister at Mount Vernon is the Reverend Moselle Sanders. How far afield do you take any meals? It's just as far as people want us to bring them. Yeah. Anywhere in the city, we got uh, about six vans in the streets just delivering dinners aside from the cars. So it really doesn't matter to us how far they Is the whole congregation involved in this? All of these people, uh, some of them are members of the church, 
some of them are not. It's just community people. It, it, it's great because everybody gets involved. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, the money for it comes from community people. Might be two dollars, might be five dollars. They just want their donation. And is the gospel about doing things for people? I think that's all the gospel is about. I, I don't think you can talk to me about Christ if I'm hungry. Moselle Sanders became a minister 18 years ago. Before that, in his own words, you name it, I been it. He took me to the disused school building he rents from the school board for one dollar a year to house the Indianapolis OIC. Indianapolis OIC, that's Opportunities Industrialization Centers. It's a manpower program for the purpose of training disadvantaged people for jobs. Apart from typing and key punch, there are classes in English, maths, minority history and urban relations. Reverend Sanders said he thought of it as a mission, as well as a manpower program. He said you spent 50% of your time at OIC. Why not drop this church and spend 100% of your time there? then OIC wouldn't be church, and church wouldn't be OIC. Does OIC need to be church? OIC is church to a great extent, and church is OIC. I don't think you can separate them, because we're talking about blood, human beings. We're going to ask you to join hands with the person closest to you. You don't feel that you need prayer. Pray for someone who does. Prayer changes things. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. It's easy to talk about the burdens these people carry. More important in trying to follow the spirit of Protestantism to talk about the burdens they don't carry. They don't carry the sort of promise of heaven that anesthetizes the world away. They don't carry the disabling weight of having to answer for the society they find themselves in. What they're experiencing is what matters, they tell you, and nobody needs to label it. There are those behind prison walls. There are those in the hospital. There are those psychologically disturbed. There are those who feel unwanted. There are those who feel unnecessary. There are those who feel that the world is against them. Somehow we would want them to know that you made them in your image and likeness. In the name of our Christ, we ask it. And for his sake. Some glad morning when this night say that church is kind of like the sanitation department and that is you don't take the garbage cans uh, away you take the garbage away you leave the can because next week there'll be some more and I think that's the same thing that happens at, at church if it's one of the ways of unloading some of your frustrations uh, being revived uh, a lot of things happen here If somebody, a total stranger, said, what does your church preach? What would you say to him? The gospel. 
Christ, him crucified, to love thy neighbor, and I think that's key. I don't think that you can hate people and help people at the same time. The weakness of the modern Christian church is that she has so far not been identified as a friend of sinners. Sometimes I think the church is like a cemetery. It takes in everything and put out nothing. And some of us, just like that, we'll take the benevolent offering, the general offering, and, and all the other offerings. And, 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 and somebody next door can be starving, and $2 is the difference between feeding a family. We want to know what church do you belong to. We want to know what did you do with your money. What difference does it make? Does it make if the person is home? That's after the fact. The guy who wakes up with a million dollars really don't have too much to be upset about across a week except to protect his money. But the person who weathered the storm all the week had a lot to be grateful for. And I think that's a mechanism, it's a means of expressing one's gratitude to God. And he was sure answer, Jesus, our representative, through his own blood, had washed them whiter than snow. The question arose, who are these people? John said, these are they. Oh, these are they, the rich and the poor. These are they, these are they, whose robes have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. These are they who stood triumph. These are they who had tribulation. These are they that were knocked down by the blind gods of the world. These are they that were called everything but a child of God. These were they by grace they were saved through faith. Lord, please have mercy. Jesus, my elder brother. Jesus, the friend to the friends. Jesus, the way maker out of no way. Jesus, the root of David. Jesus, the lily of the valley. Jesus, the rose of Sharon. Jesus, the bright morning star. Jesus, the heart fiction. Jesus, the mind revelation. Jesus, the company keeping. Jesus, the high tower. Jesus, 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 Jesus. I found in him my resting place. He showed me the land. I heard, I heard, I heard the voice. spirit of Protestantism, and that spirit in the course of the last four and a half centuries has found different abodes. And I have a hunch that you in your search almost instinctively found yourself going to the place to which this spirit and its history are now moving.
The most thrilling thing for me during this search has been the discovery that the word Protestant has an underlayer of meaning which was always there but is rarely revealed. I'll try and summarize it as far as I understand it. Every idea, every statement, every institution has a tendency to harden up and go dead. And every human being has a tendency to choose that moment, the death moment, to take the stiffening idea and worship it. Whether it's the idea of the holiness of a man or the infallibility of a Bible. In other words, every man, whether he likes it or not, has the makings of an idolater. Now it's possible that in the 16th century, the reformers had to attack what they saw as a rigidity in the church they belonged to. And at that moment, it may have been right to call them Protestant. But what happens to the protesters when they, in their turn, go rigid and create institutions and formulations and cramping dogma? By rights, they forfeit their Protestant label and it's passed on like a trophy to the next challenger, wherever he presents himself. For, say the people who think along these lines, Protestantism is an impulse to keep things moving. And anyone who builds a shrine around an impulse and claims to have kept it still and caught it is deluding himself.